Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces Part 1, Stratton Dreams Book 1, Desolation's Tears Read by the author Chapter 2, Desolation and Redemption 1. An inch of freshly fallen early morning snow crunched under Talitha's boots, compressing the latest coating into the perpetual frozen glaze that comprised the streets and walkways they trod. It was still dark, but what passed for night was just the dimmer brilliance of the snowfall intensifying either the light reflected off multiple moons or that of the constellations alone. Outside, there was simply nowhere to escape the light and by sunrise, still several hours away, it would be blinding. Talitha's flash shield entourage maintained the general order and enforced the mandates of the dominating conglomerate, ComFed, which had governed the strata without significant challenge for the past 50 Stratton standard years. The strata, representing the seven known frequencies of existence, that vibrated in succession along the greater electromagnetic spectrum. Talitha Masters had spent the last ten years hiding in plain sight upon the planet Desolation, a former gas giant reduced to the great hunk of rock that had hidden at its core, encircling its particular stratum system in one of the outer orbits. Unless one was native-born, which Talitha was not, Life on desolation often felt like having been sentenced to hard labor in some obscure cum-fed gulag. Few who visited of their own volition remained long, unless the various misfortunes that had led them there in the first place somehow prevented their subsequent departure. The discovery of minerals crucial to various Stratton industries had made then maintained the world as a profitable mining endeavor for over 2,000 years. Massive atmospheric processors embedded in the foundations of both poles had made the troposphere just barely tolerable for more than one of those millennia. The habitable polar regions of desolation cycled through its seasons with a wobbling regularity of five Stratton Standard months each, winter to deep winter, followed by deepest winter, which was utterly inimical to any form of life possessing lungs and a circulatory system, and then back again to something that was laughingly considered spring. Talitha found that she didn't mind deep winter in the same way her cum-fed security chaperones did. She had dragged her heels, turning her stated ten minutes into twenty. While there was little the flash cops were willing to do besides their persistent grumbling, hoping to speed her along. Let them grumble, she thought. After all, she understood it was her skill set their superiors required. And these two weren't going to do anything that might permanently put a black mark on their own records. The incident out on the ice had most likely been designated some form of classified security breach, or else they'd not have bothered to enlist her to catalog the forensics. Once at Desolation's primary branch of ComFed's Information Retrieval and Storage Archive, Talitha requisitioned every piece of equipment she might possibly need on the ice along with redundant units, just in case the primaries failed. By the time they'd left, she'd overloaded the two hapless flash shields with far more equipment than she could ever possibly use for the stated task of vidlogging some crash site. Desolation supported over 500 inhabited outposts spread across the polar extremes of both hemispheres. But the City of Redemption served as the planet's northern capital, swapping administrative duties with its southern counterpart, Oasis, depending on the season. But the absurdly named Redemption boasted Desolation's largest spaceport, 
while supporting the most ore-refining land barges in perpetual rotation, processing the valuable elements on their annual trips to the equatorial mining installations, maintaining the thousands of land barges while servicing the needs of their crews and engineers, as well as the miners who actually excavated the raw materials, was Desolation's primary industry, as nearly all the world's ore was being systematically extracted for off-world usage by whatever governing interest benefited the most. ComFed may have been the latest iteration of Stratton administration, but not even their authoritarian methods could gut the planet any faster than desolation herself would allow. 2. As Talitha arrived at her escort's final destination, along the border of the Land Barge Servicing District, she was leading the overburdened flash cops through the continuing gentle snowfall like twin pups on a leash. Waiting for them was a military-grade armored transport and a squad of genuine com-fed flashguard. There was no humor displayed on their grim faces. These were the muscle that enforced com-fed's edicts even on an otherwise lawless world like Desolation. The squad commander wasn't pleased. Talitha rapidly surmised there would be no tolerance for the game she'd inflicted on her police escorts. His name patch read Drexler, the insignia on his oversized white parka just below the ComFed corporate logo indicated his rank as lieutenant. ComFed's logo represented the seven layers of the strata shaped like a globe, bisected as each individual stratum was symbolized to serve the needs of the whole. Those strata represented at the top and bottom were smallest, subtly indicative of their overall representation in the governing boardroom of the executorium. Between each level was a band of shadow indicating the otherwise non-existent gaps dividing each layer along the greater electromagnetic spectrum. Across the center three strata, were emblazoned the six letters every citizen of the Combined Federation was expected to acknowledge and embrace, as it was this which held both the literal patch and the figurative strata itself together. C-O-M-F-E-D. Comfed. Lieutenant Drexler's sepia-toned skin stood out in stark relief, against the brilliant white shimmer of their surroundings as he lowered his parka's hood and raised his glare-shielding goggles from a set of piercing eyes. Here was a man, Talitha reasoned, who'd endure some discomfort in order to lock eyes with whoever had warranted his displeasure. We expected you here an hour ago, Drexler barked. A factually incorrect statement, but... Talitha recognized an officer who had no problem speaking in exaggerated terms in order to emphasize his point. He directed his words to the two beleaguered flash cops struggling with Talitha's gear, but his gaze was decidedly fixed on Talitha herself. Physically hampered from saluting as he should have an officer from a superior service branch, Officer Stanks practically blurted, Lieutenant Drexler, Infotech Talitha Masters, as ordered. Talitha felt it sounded like an apology. His abruptly emphasized, Sir, came after a delay like an afterthought. What's all that shake? Drexler asked the flash shield, indicating the strapped cases and bags of equipment, yet his gaze on Talitha never wavered. Officer Lebrow was quick to assert where any blame for the delay should lie. Infotech equipment. Dump it, Drexler ordered. As the various protective cases and strapped bags were dropped onto the snow, Drexler whispered something to a sergeant behind him, facilitating the last of the soldiers to finish boarding their treaded transport. Talitha heard an affirmation, and then Drexler was once again all hers. 
Masters, he said with an inflection of suppressed annoyance. Talitha met his gaze with her own without flinching, the only respect she was willing to concede. You've got five seconds to snag your cam and secure your ass aboard this transport. Talitha nodded slightly and raised the two bags she was holding. The rest of the shike was property of Comfed. She might be an employee, but she wasn't going to trouble herself over supplies the two flash shields were on record for having requisitioned. Reinforcing her undaunted expression, she followed Drexler's gesture indicating the rear hatch of the armored transport. But she couldn't help but notice the big gun on top, along with the twin pulse cannons on either side of its armored hull. Contrary to her initial attitude, someone in authority considered this mission as serious. Inside, she navigated a path through the legs of eight flash guard that had secured their seats before her. Good morning, girls and boys, she chirped. Following her instinctual defiance of the lieutenant, Talitha knew it was safest under such circumstances to subtly misdirect eyewitnesses to fixate on her banter, and thereby fail to register the more important details of her identity. Silence. Two flash guards were seated across from one another in the second row, from which they would be the second pair to disembark once the hatch was reopened. Each carried AR-500K suppression guns. It had been decades since Talitha last used one, but at a glance she saw that nothing had changed in their design under Comfed. These rapid-fire scattershot fully automatic assault weapons could pepper an entire city block in under 10 seconds with thousands of explosive-tipped fragmentation shells the enemy in her era had called paydays. The gun itself had been cynically dubbed the Crowd Pleaser. It amused Talitha that the slang remained in popular use today. And an extra special good morning to the two of you, she quipped to the pair. They glared at her, but otherwise displayed no other emotion. They were trained assault troops. She was merely a civilian employee and, if necessary, collateral damage. Such were the dictates of Confed. Take that seat near the front, masters, ordered Drexler bringing up the rear. He followed her to a pair of seats directly behind the open cockpit. The sergeant sat on a seat that folded down from the rear hatch, from which he'd facilitate disembarkation upon arrival at their destination. The driver fired up the engine, while the onboard gunner seated next to him most likely hoped for something to shoot at before their mission ended. 3. The vibration of the treads resonated up through the floor plating, through the soles of Talitha's snow-caked boots, and then up through her legs, not unlike the way one traveled, translated through the layers of the strata itself, from one vibrational frequency to another. En route to their unknown destination, Talitha settled in for the journey, observing and mentally cataloging each and every member of the unit, discerning individual quirks despite their stoic demeanors. Can anybody tell me anything about where we're going? she asked. No verbal response, just a smattering of grunts, some fidgeting, a sniffle wiped on a parka sleeve. One hard-ass dabbed at their eyes, wiping away the involuntary tears that cold weather elicited in some. She asked the pair stowing the crowd-pleasers, That is some heavy-duty firepower you're packing. Both flash guards shifted uncomfortably in their seats, obviously agitated, perhaps even nervous about whatever preliminary assessment they'd received on their mission. While all I have is this itty-bitty vidcam, Talitha teased with a waggle of the cam unit she pulled from her bag. 
She knew there was nothing like a little surveillance to keep them all honest. As Talitha had intended, due to her outgoing nature and engaging cheer, not one of those hard asses dared catch her eye. Each had already made a quick and decisive assessment that their passenger was not worthy of any deeper consideration. Calculating the total number of people in the transport, she found something else to occupy the squad's thoughts. Did anyone realize I'm your 13th passenger? That prompted the reaction she'd hoped for. The squad became more agitated. It seemed some superstitions were eternal. But Lieutenant Drexler had had enough. You've got one job on this hall, masters. Drexler said, leaning forward in his seat. Less than half a meter separated her nose from his. His was a grim and genuinely hardened face. His eyes indicated he'd seen combat, but he hadn't gloried in a job he'd believed, then as now, simply needed to be done. Talitha kept her grin buried. She could snap his neck and take out his entire unit with nothing more than the vidcam in her hand before any one of them could get off a shot. The cabin bay was cramped, and they were hampered by their bulk. She had no such restrictions. She would adapt. Yet she also recognized that any experienced vet like Drexler assigned to desolation was probably on probation for violating some com-fed regulation that most likely deserved to be broken. He finished, and that begins and ends with you keeping your damn hole shut. My apologies, Lieutenant, she answered respectfully this time. Drexler displayed no such compulsion to reciprocate any respect of his own. He leaned back, no longer acknowledging her, seemingly content to make the remainder of their journey in relative silence. Drexler's actions and demeanor suggested he was the type of officer who would actually choose to die with his unit if he believed some greater good might come of it. It was noble and selfless, traits of a code she could respect. She'd found long ago that genuine nobility was uncommon in the human species. Against her better instincts, Talitha concluded she liked him. The driver intruded on Talitha's reverie with a tone drenched in sarcasm. Oh, 500 hours. Time for our favorite ray of sunshine, he called out to all his fellow hard asses in the cabin. Through the front windows, there was still no hint of the rising sun. Only the pervasive light gray of the starlit snow stretching round the night-bound hemisphere. They were driving east, but the sun would actually rise behind them, peeking over the structures of redemption first before reaching them out on the ice as desolation was one of the few worlds that revolved in retrograde in all but one of its Stratton variants, counter to the rest in their particular solar system. The driver clicked on the internal monitor, the small screen illuminated to reveal the logo of NCS, the Strata's Ethernet Communication System, a division of ComFed a lightning bolt cracking the seven-tiered globe that represented the strata in half. An image seemingly in direct contradiction to the parent company's official emblem. Speakers carried the enthusiastic voice of an announcer caught in mid-intro. That strong discerning voice of the people, Salmoni Cadesius! Talitha had always found the broadcaster's theme music to be patronizing, triumphant and patriotic enough to stir the blood, and yet with an underlying counter-harmony in a minor key that insinuated the very human spirit the music was celebrating was simultaneously being undermined. Conspiracy theories surrounding her theme music had been raised many times, 
to which the elder Cadesius only laughed and suggested the freedoms Comfed provided had obviously left some of humanity with far too much free time. The screen soon filled with an elderly face deeply lined with the wisdom of age. Selmini Cadesius looked as if she would kill your dog and then send you to bed without supper for having dared to cry over the loss. Through the speakers, she practically snarled from the screen. To all the worlds in our glorious union of the combined federations. And with that stern and ominous opening, she smiled her face cracking with the jubilation of one's favorite grandparent, for whom all transgressions were absolved, every tear wiped clear, and every night's dinner was dessert. Good morning, Comfed, and good morning, Strata! Her eyes sparkled like a child who still saw the seven tears as a symbol of hope, while her voice matched the naivete. Duality was apparently an intentional part of the act. Her dubious on-screen persona that left audiences arguing over which one was her true face. Even the conspiracy and controversy over her theme music could be reasoned away as just another facet of the show's ingenious design. Keep the audience guessing. Always leave them coming back for more. Lieutenant Drexler reached into the cockpit, stretching his arm and fingers to their full length, flicking the switch that shut off Selmini's face and voice in mid-syllable. Her empty hole is the last thing we need on a run like this, he muttered, exerting what limited authority he possessed. He seemed smug in his action. Only Talitha discerned Drexler didn't dislike Selmini Cadesius quite as much as he was currently projecting. She interpreted that the officer was covering his own growing anxiety the closer they got to their destination. He checked his forearm data log. Another hour till we get there, he whispered to Talitha. A concession to the uncertainty he felt combined with a desire to set all his affairs in order before they arrived. They rode on in silence. Talitha still sensed the tension emanating off everyone aboard. She realized none of them, not even the lieutenant, knew what they were about to encounter. But they weren't going in blind. They were the proper response suggested by some previous reconnaissance that an armored transport and a 12-man combat unit with two crowd-pleasers being sent to assess the situation with a professional vidlogger in tow was finally resonating with Talitha. There might be a reason for their concern, and perhaps before the sun rose and set again, Drexler might be glad their 13th passenger was with them after all. This has been Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces, Book One, Desolation's Tears, read by the author. Audio and video production by A.J. Blackburn. Original music composed and performed by Frankie Caffrey. Brian J.L. Glass's Dark Spaces and B.J.L.G.'s Dark Spaces are copyright. 2022 by Brian J.L. Glass.